What we see is only appearance. Art does not reproduce the visible, it makes visible. A window open upon the world. Bent over his self-portrait, a young man turns his back on the light. Paul Clay is above all a draftsman. He is in search of a language which will shake the established order. Obsessed with color, he looks for that passage which will lead from drawing to painting. Nineteen hundred. Germany is at its cultural zenith. Paul Klee is twenty-one years old. Born to a German father and a Swiss mother, he leaves Bern to study fine arts in Munich, a bustling city which attracts numerous artists and intellectuals. Gifted for painting, writing, and music, he hesitates between these three disciplines. He does not yet know that he will become one of the major painters of the 20th century. Reflections on the art of the portrait. Many will fail to grasp the truth of my mirror, yet my intention is not to reflect the surface as would a photographic plate, but to attain to inwardness. The winged hero. Born with a single wing, a figure rooted to the ground by his infirmity, persists nonetheless in attempting to take flight. The unfinished angel will never leave him. An allegory illustrating the human condition, divided between heaven and earth, between tragedy and comedy. Of comedy, one could say that the mask signifies art and that behind it hides man. In spring, I set out the following program. In the first place, the art of life. As an ideal profession, the poetic art and philosophy. As a realistic profession, plastic art. And finally, lacking a private income, the art of drawing. His drawing is precise, meticulous, fully controlled. His refinement places him in the great German graphic tradition. Dürer, Kranich, Grunwald. In Munich, the young Clay joins the German avant-garde Blue Rider group, which includes painters such as Franz Marc, Kuben, Maka, and especially Kandinsky, who will become a close friend. Kandinsky was much more advanced than me in his development. I could have been his pupil, and in a certain way I was, since some remark or other of his could illuminate my research in a positive and encouraging way. Clay also keeps a diary. Childhood memories, dreams, first sensual awakenings, reflections on painting and music, travel notes. He busies himself with his home, too. He has just married Lily, a young piano teacher. Felix, their son, takes up his time and attention. And when Lily suggests giving more classes to help support the family, he protests. And who will look after the home? Me? Impossible. I must work. I can't be giving all my time to it. Yet this is exactly what he will do. 
In his spare moments to amuse Felix, he even creates a puppet theater. These figurines reflect his imaginary world and allow him to parody the world of adults. The crowned poet, the barber of Baghdad, the German nationalist, Mr. Death. Felix Clay remembers, my father created some 50 figures. He shaped the heads out of plaster or other materials, matchboxes, plugs, wood, ox bones, and paper mache. He himself appears on stage, creating a puppet in his own image. Back to the studio. Contrary to the Impressionists, color and light are not at the forefront. He begins to assimilate the law of contrasts, mastering chiaroscuro, grasping the idea of tonality. Through superimposing layers of black watercolor, I'm trying now to render light simply as the deployment of energy. In this way, a mathematically proportioned chiaroscuro takes form. Yet I still cannot paint, in spite of the refined art with which I deploy the chiaroscuro. April 1914. Like so many other painters, Clay feels the call of the Orient. Tunisia is the luminous door through which he steps in order to find himself. Tuesday, April 7th. In the afternoon appears the African coast. Then, the line of a mountain on whose side in strict rhythm the white shapes of houses come into view. The fable materializes, as yet far off, impalpable, but clearly visible. Tunis, Wednesday, April 8, 1914. My head full of nocturnal impressions from the evening before. Art, nature, myself. Straight down to work, I painted a watercolor in the Arab quarter. Have tackled the synthesis of the architecture of the city with the architecture of the painting. Not yet in the pure state, but an effort full of charm that blends the ambiance and euphoria of the journey. Fifteenth of April, 1914. As a prelude to the wonders of Karawan, we slaked our thirst with tea at an Arab wedding. Like something straight out of the Arabian Nights, a feast of most real and delicious brews. An aroma at once penetrating, heady and cleansing. Not isolated impressions, but a whole. Here I feel really at home. One of the last works from this journey, before the gates of Kairouan. Painted April 16th, a revelation. The atmosphere penetrates me with such sweetness that without really trying, an ever greater assurance arises within me. Color takes hold of me. I do not need to look for it. It possesses me. I know it. Here is the meaning of this happy moment. Color and I are one. I am a painter.
On returning to Munich, he loses no time in painting other watercolors from memory. He is at the gates of abstraction. Like music, which he thought of dedicating himself to at one time, painting involves superimposition, rhythm, equilibrium, and harmony. Might the watercolor provide an ideal transition between the figurative and the abstract? A secret passage to transparency? Clay begins to gain recognition. Excited by his innovative work, the artists that teach at the Bauhaus invite Clay to join them. Founded in 1919 in Weimar, in Germany, by the architect Walter Gropius, this revolutionary school is a creative laboratory. Its aim is to break down the partitioning between painting, sculpture, and architecture, and to apply this new aesthetic to daily life. This teaching stimulates Clay. He takes a particular interest in the play of equilibrium. I am about to fall to my left, and I reach out my hand towards the right for a point of support so as not to lose my balance. Let us imagine this action is repeated several times from bottom to top. On the foundation stone, you place stone one, which tips the balance leftwards. Then, stone two is placed as a counterweight, stone three re-establishes the axis towards the left, and so on until the last stone finally steadies the balancing forces. Clay draws upon the laws of physics. He studies them, and then transposes them into his painting. Unstable equilibrium, a mini-drama of the horizontal, the scaffolding is wobbly. The inclined bands waver in the direction of the arrows only to regain their balance through the play of counter movement. Man's innate sense of verticality is a living reality which prevents him from falling. Yet in some cases we prolong the horizontal just as the tightrope walker does with his pole. For each one of his constructions, Clay invents an appropriate technique. First, he draws his figure in pencil on a sheet of paper. The hand must be carried by the line, just like the tightrope walker by his rope. He then layers a tracing sheet in black oil paint, enabling him to transfer his drawing to another sheet, creating enigmatic patches beneath the tracing, resembling those of a blotting paper. The drawing is not direct, it is transferred, enriched with accidents and improvisations. It imbibes and is impregnated with the process of the transfer. Exercises of balance and movement teach us how to tend towards the essential, to the functional as opposed to the external impression. We learn to recognize the underlying forces, the prehistory of the visible.
The parallels between music and plastic art impinge upon me more and more. Yet even so, I cannot see how to analyze them. However, that the two arts are of a temporal nature would be easy to prove. Born into a musical family, Clay himself was a musician. His son Felix recalls, One of the three rooms of our small apartment was reserved for music. My mother gave piano lessons there, and almost every evening Paul and Lily played sonatas. Modern music? Oh no, only Bach, Handel, Mozart, Beethoven, and Schubert. This young lady, my future wife, I came to know her through playing music in the autumn of 1899. Every morning before painting, he puts in an hour of violin practice. And once he sets to work, his drawing becomes, as in a music score, the transcription of a melodic line. Music for me is like an enchanted beloved. A beloved who inspires in him several figurative works of art. Drawn from a Mozart opera, the Fior de Ligi is the imaginary portrait of a soprano he admires. The lines are attached to each other by musical notes to reveal the figure. An articulated doll with raised arms, almost a puppet. Così fan tutte. but music inspires him to abstract works most of all. Applied layer upon layer, the watercolor generates nuances which are enriched by the previous stratas. Forms and colors are interwoven. Clay paints like a musician, note after note, superimposing themes. Where there is rhythm, tempo, repetition, variation, or silence, time occupies a central place in his work. Resonances and intervals appear in other compositions as a division of time. Polyphonic painting is in this sense superior to music in that the temporal is more spatial. Thus the notion of simultaneity is even more richly revealed. In preparation for his classes at the Bauhaus, Clay constructs mobiles by assembling flexible rods, elastic bands, and wires. The teaching staff brings together some of the most important painters of the century. Among the Bauhaus masters are Lionel Feininger, Vasily Kandinsky, the old friend he meets again, Oskar Schlemmer, George Mucha. Clay is entrusted with theoretical courses in pictorial composition. Class of February 13, 1922. The exercise proposed today is the combination of solid and fluid structures. The final result should be a rhythmic, organic composition somewhere between the rigid and the flowing. So then, we have two figures, a circle and a straight line. How can their encounter give rise to life? One of you suggested the following answer. In and of itself, this could mean something. A standard lamp, or a vase swollen in the middle. 
or the pendulum of a clock, or any other object. Their simple fusion into a thing is nothing but superposition, not a solution to a problem. There is no organic conflict between the circle and the straight line, completely witless. Now we shall slip a wooden lathe under a bottle end, an optical lens, or a glass ball. In the first case, the circle is stronger than the straight line. The line is deformed once it enters the circle. As for the circle, it does not change. The fluid character wins out over the solid. In the second case, the straight line uses its most violent penetrative force. The circle will be modified by it. The straight line gets the upper hand. Finally, the two figures come together and modify each other through a phenomenon of reciprocal assimilation. The circle is no longer a circle. The straight line is no longer a straight line. I will choose each time one or other of these motifs according to the spirit of the composition and hence will obtain a formal expression of struggle or of friendship. In 1927, so as to put a face to this demonstration, Clay himself attempts the exercise. Its title, Physiognomical Flash. Is this work perhaps an historic premonition? Imagine that you are dead and that after long years of being away you are given a glance at the earth. Seeing a simple street lamp, an old dog cocking its leg, you could not help yourself from trembling with emotion. If Clay is above all a painter of dreams and poetry, he is nonetheless a disciplined artist. He works tirelessly on several canvases at once. To succeed in what you undertake, it is essential never to work with a preconceived final image in mind. On the contrary, one must devote oneself entirely to the task in hand. Will and discipline are everything. He will spend his life between dreaming and classifying. Poet, philosopher, and here I am become a bureaucrat as well, having established a long catalogue of my entire artistic production. His classification distinguishes between works from the model and works of imagination, with special mention for those he considers more important and which he will conserve. He is very methodical in the way he creates, paints, and frames his canvases. If my works sometimes convey the impression of being primitive, it is due to the discipline I apply in reducing them to the fewest number of steps. So it is the opposite of being primitive. Cézanne is to me the master par excellence, much more so than Van Gogh. Clay combines the most austere rigor with a most unbridled fantasy. To title his works, he draws on expressions from his early poems which serve to enrich the image, like a counterpoint. For example, the twittering machine. Looking at a Tree, a poem from 1902. 
The little birds are enviable. They avoid thinking of the trunk and roots, and self-satisfied they sway all day long, agile, singing at the ramified extremities. A kind of fire shoots up and is spread by the hand over a sheet in the form of a spark before returning to the eye, its place of origin. Or no doubt further still. But be careful. Without moving completely away from this world, never let that spark die out. Take your students to nature. Let them live the experience, seeing how a bud forms, how a tree grows, how a butterfly spreads its wings. They will become just as rich and determined as nature itself. Because contemplation is a revelation, a glimpse into the workshop of God. There rests the mystery of creation. A tireless walker a minute observer of the little things in the world around him. Clay knows it is in the detail of their functioning that he will find what he is looking for. He does not go to nature as a painter goes to his motif. He observes it not to reproduce it, but to grasp its essence. In the past, one pictured things visible on earth that one loved to see or would have loved to see. Today, the relativity of the visible has become obvious, and one contents oneself with seeing in it only a simple, singled-out example from the totality of the universe. For clay, the laws of nature are applicable to the process of artistic creation. The painter lives at a time of great scientific and technological breakthroughs. These discoveries uncover new frontiers of perception and offer new representations of the world. Access to what was until then invisible becomes possible. He translates this scientific revolution into his art. Clay is in osmosis with nature. He perceives its innermost movements. He observes the most elementary phenomena of growth in the leaf of a tree, for example, and transposes them into his work. His composition is born, develops, and organizes itself exactly like a plant. Growth is a progressive movement of matter upon a fixed ground. In the terrestrial domain, movement needs energy. The same goes for the stroke, the line, and the other elements of creation, which are surface, tone, and color. I place myself at a more distant, more original point of creation, where I hope to find formulae for man, beast, plant, mineral, earth, fire, water, air, and all the circling forces at once. Since his Tunisian watercolors, Clay now deepens his chromatic discoveries by using checkered patterns. 
The influence of the Bauhaus can also be felt in its constructivist and abstract character. He explores them endlessly in multiple variations. The works of Cézanne, Picasso, and Braque, seen in Paris in 1912, made a profound impact on him. His visit to Robert Delaunay's studio was even more decisive, as he witnessed the move away from Cubism towards pure color. Robert Delaunay has found a radical and startling solution. His pictures are completely abstract, without any known figurative motif, but with color itself as subject. It's as though they were animated by an autonomous existence, a living breath. Delaunay's work had a profound influence on clay. But how does one move from the chromatic circle to the squares of a chessboard? First of all, a black background. It represents space. The challenge? To work within the original frame of reference, which is black, and at the same time connect the colors with each other. An optical dialogue, a dialectic through which each patch of color reveals a luminous density which conditions its size. For clay, there is no structure. Nothing exists except color. Each surface must establish itself, defend its authenticity, find its true place. In this conflict between luminosity and density, quantity and quality, he will have to find the absolute balance of the forces at play. Question. How to restore the balance between two contradictory colors? If a pure red weighs more than a bright one, a dark red must necessarily be added to it. The French painter Ingres, it is said, organized repose. For my part, I would like to organize movement. The eye examines the surface like a grazing animal. In this way, the eye moves from one value which attracts it to others further on, once the first values have been grazed. In the universe, movement is the essential given the basis of all becoming. The sacred mountain of Delphi. Parnassus is home to the Muses, Apollo and Dionysus. 30 years earlier, during a trip to Italy in 1902, he was deeply impressed by the mosaics in Rome, Naples and Ravenna.
1932, Ad Parnassum. In this major work, we find Clay at the summit of his path towards light and harmony. Technical innovation is essential and stimulating for him. Each experiment opens new doors. Point, line, surface, color, superimposition, juxtaposition. It is thus that I return to the glacis, and I will probably bring into it the famed pointillism. Unlike Seurat, he does not seek to reconstitute the optical phenomena of light. It is rather a case of creating an effect of depth, rhythm, and movement through superimpositions. On a colored background, he lays a dab of white. Above, a touch of gray or of color. Stroke by stroke, he plays with the effects of transparency. By superimposing these traces of color, he transmits all the stages of his work, all the secrets behind his painter's touch. Sometimes I get to imagining a work of such dimensions that it would cover the complete domains of elements, of object, of content, and of style. That will always remain a dream, but it's good to believe in it from time to time. In art, nothing is ever done in a hurry. One must always let the work develop according to its own rhythm, and if one day it manages to achieve maturity, then so much the better. January 30th, 1933. My dear Lily, have you heard Hitler has become chancellor in a cabinet where he does not have the majority? It does indeed make one think, and to take a stand against this spectacle of German domestic politics, lamentable as it has been and as it remains. But I no longer believe that this whole business can be resolved. The people are decidedly too ill-suited for real things. In this regard, they are too stupid. The artist finds himself confronted with history, with the daily life of Germany in 1933. We find a man wounded and suffering, who responds and expresses himself silently in his work. His art turns into scribbled, nervous, sometimes even violent drawings. In total, he completes 245 in one year. On March 17, 1933, his studio is searched by the Nazis. Clay has to prove that he is not of Jewish origin. April 6, 1933. My dear Lily, 
To undertake anything at all against such crude insults is beneath me. Even if it were true that I were Jewish, that would change nothing in the value of my person or of my work. A Jew or a foreigner is not necessarily inferior to a German. I have no right to abandon this point of view unless I am to be immortalized by ridicule. On April 21st, considered incompetent, Clay is dismissed from the post of professor which he has held at the Fine Arts School of Dusseldorf since his departure from the Bauhaus. Day by day, the abyss widens between the man and this world, which tramples on humanistic values. Like his friend Kandinsky and many others, he is a marked man. December 22nd, 1933. Dear Felix, I have now been expelled. Tomorrow evening I shall leave this place. Then will come the beautiful days of Christmas when the bells will chime in children's heads. I have aged somewhat over the last few weeks, but I don't want to let any of my bitterness show through. Or if it does, may it be tempered by humor. Two days later, December 24th, 1933, humiliated, he flees Germany to take refuge in Bern, Switzerland, his native country. Nineteen thirty seven. Along with other painters, Clay is mocked in the propaganda exhibitions organized by the Nazis to denigrate an art which they define as degenerate and which they compare to that of the mentally ill. About a hundred of these works are seized and withdrawn from German museums. Is it I who is limping, or is it Europe? My dear Kandinsky, the times we live in are too much for us, if only they were a little less. I would so much love to believe in Europe. For me, of course, everything hangs on the quality of my work. And until now, nothing has prevented me from pursuing my path. I hope the same is true for you. Let us believe in the Phoenix Europe. Bern, 1938. Affected by rampant scleroderma, Clay knows he has little time left to live. Rest, walks, work. Between suffering and serenity, this inevitable decline frees up superhuman reserves of strength. He receives visits from Kandinsky, Brock, Picasso. Asked about what impression he made, Picasso situates him between Pascal and Napoleon. Insula Dulcamara, a landscape set free of the terrestrial world, as though balanced between past and future, between gravity and lightness. A bittersweet island, as the title says. One must not take fright at the mingling of less digestible elements. It is enough to hope that these things less easy to assimilate will not upset the balance. In this way, life is certainly more enthralling than a well-ordered bourgeois existence. And each one can, according to his taste, draw the sweet and the savory from each of the cups. A helpless man pretends to ignore the mortal and demonic power symbolized by a snake. Tender spring-like colors striped with harsh black lines that symbolize destiny. Below, the number one, the unique. Then the smiling wisdom which envelops the man with its cosmic scarf, reassuring him. An abstract allegory of a return to origins? 
in Sula Dulcamara, heralds his last works. Inhabited by enigmatic signs, another world makes itself felt, symbolic, troubled, and serene. The poet Heinrich Heine once wrote, Smile, as if death were tickling us with its sickle. Nineteen thirty nine. To find a passage from here to the beyond, the painter turns again to his dear winged figures, some thirty angels in this one year. Some are laughing, others crying. Whether they are angelic or demonic, these emblematic figures accompany him until his death. With playful detachment, these creatures allow him to keep his fear at bay and to transform it into a smile. Above all, they express his state of mind at the moment, balanced between life and death. The diabolical will blend with the celestial. Dualism will not be treated in its own terms, but in its complementary truth. Together with these presences, he creates a series of figures whose limbs are disarticulated, whose bodies are coming apart, like the times, like himself, as though they were tragic puppets whose different elements were suddenly dispersed, like so many pieces of a mysterious puzzle. In the final works, the paintbrush, laden with matter, paints schematic images which go right to the essential. Appearing from 1935 onwards, this broad, raw, crude, almost childlike stroke will be the hallmark of his last expressive period. Naturally, I have not arrived by chance at this fateful impasse. Most of my works show and proclaim that the time has come. Leaving a legacy of over 9,000 works, the last of which will remain unfinished, Paul Clay dies on June 29, 1940, in Locarno. In this world, no one can pin me down, for I reside just as much among the dead as among those not yet born, a little closer to creation than is usual, and yet still much too far away. <laughs>